Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as presented by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Jeremiah. I don't know how often you read Jeremiah. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge, uh, but we're going to see what we can make of it. This is Lesson 12 in that series entitled Back to Egypt, and it's a lesson that our World Church will be studying on December 19 of 2015. I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to be especially <coughs> focusing on Jeremiah from about chapter 40 up to 44 with looking at a few other passages. But uh, in, those, in those chapters, we have plenty to talk about. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you in humble confession of our sins and of our need to, to learn from the mistakes of others, such as the examples of those that Jeremiah was trying to minister to us, to them. Help us to know how we can best serve you in our day, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this lesson actually takes us to the end, well, as much as we know about the end of Jeremiah's life. And we'll see how that unfolds. And it's largely a story about those final events. We're going to pick up at the time when Jerusalem fell. And, uh, Which time? Well, this would, be, this would be the final. Absolute destruction. Uh, this would be 580, 586, probably 585, somewhere in there, B.C. And this is the time when Nebuchadnezzar came back the third time. This is number three. And he says... I've had it with these people. I'm not being gentle with them anymore. I've, you know, they just keep rebelling against me. And he said, I'm, when, I get, when I conquer them, he, he sieges the place for two and a half years. And after that, he literally just said, I'm not going to leave anything here that's, that's habitable. And he left Jerusalem in a, as a pile of rubble. That's basically what happened. So what did Jeremiah, how did he survive? What did he have to say? during those times, you may recognize, and we're not talking about the Book of Lamentations at all, but the Book of Lamentation was written during those, during those siege years, that two and a half years of siege in the, book of, in the city of Jerusalem. So that's a book that would fit somewhere just before, really during Lesson 11, I guess, that we studied last week, and some into Lesson 12. Uh, and we'll, we'll just mention one or two verses from Lamentations as we go. And Lamentations was written by Jeremiah? Lamentations was also written by Jeremiah. Yes, exactly. So, um, this is not a happily ever after kind of a story. Um, these people seemed to be absolutely determined to do exactly the opposite of what God wanted them to do. Now, I don't know whether they were bent on rebellion. Um, see what you think. Um, there wasn't much left when Nebuchadnezzar finished uh, with that siege and broke through the wall and just destroyed everything. Of course, we know that while they were inside that small compound for two and a half years, it got so bad that they were eating the bodies of people who died. People were eating their children uh, when they died. I mean, there was almost virtually nothing else to eat. There, it was amazing that it's only because of Hezekiah's tunnel, which we've mentioned briefly before, that they had water. Otherwise, that siege would have been much shorter. So we talk about Jeremiah as a weeping prophet, and I hope you're starting to get a little bit of a picture about why Jeremiah been, might have been a weeping prophet and why, what he had to weep about. Uh, could any of us be caught, you know, and here we are in the 21st century, you think anything like that could happen to any of us ever? Yes. We haven't seen what's going to happen at the end of this world. We haven't seen what's going to happen and right through the last plagues and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, God's grace is incredibly generous, but it's never forced on us. Um, this doesn't give inspiration, of course, to go on sinning. Many of the Jews seem to have developed the idea, and this was common in the days of Jesus, that if you had enough lambs to offer sacrifices, you could sort of sin ad lib. 
then you just take another lamb down there and offer it and God will forgive you. Is kind that like, kind of like indulgences? Kind of like indulgences. Um, do we have indulgences in the Adventist Church in 2015? Well, not in the not in the same overt sense. Well, something very interesting happened. Uh, let's just look at it. Jeremiah 39, verses 11 to 14. King Nebuchadnezzar had his camp set up some distance from Jerusalem, and when his soldiers finally conquered the city, they marched out everybody they, they could, uh, you know, capture, and marched them off to present themselves before Nebuchadnezzar. And here we see, but King Nebuchadnezzar commanded Nebuchadnezzar, his commanding officer, to give the following order, go and find Jeremiah, and take good care of him. Do not harm him but do for him whatever he wants. I mean, imagine a king who spent two and a half years sieging a city. And I mean, he must have been so upset at those people. Two and a half years sitting out there trying to get rid of these people, trying to break through the wall and get in there. But he somehow he found out. So how do you suppose he knew about Jeremiah? From the people fleeing? Yeah. Probably from the people fleeing. That's by far the most likely. And they, he said to Jeremiah, okay, you can do whatever you want. You can stay here if you want to. You can go to Babylonia. We'll, we'll take good care of you. Whatever you feel, to, whatever you want to do. Well, they and probably had their circles of people that, that kind of, what's the word, just kind of looked at things differently? I don't know, but you think Daniel knew about Jeremiah? And they grew up together. In Jerusalem. So there could be some connections, uh, yeah. communication connections, or Maybe. possibly. Yeah. And we know that Jeremiah wrote letters to the people in uh, near Babylon. Uh, we know that Ezekiel from Babylon uh, was taken in vision to Jerusalem. Anyway, we don't know. So what happened? Who was put in charge when the city, when the city collapsed? Remember. Gedaliah. Gedaliah. Get um, do you think any of the people or many of the people left the so-called remnant uh, fleeing Judah basically? Well, uh, I should say that a lot of people who managed to escape and sort of saw Nebuchadnezzar coming escaped to other countries. And they stayed in those other countries until they heard that Gedaliah was in charge and things were sort of calming down and, and Nebuchadnezzar was leaving. And then quite a few of them came back. And you can read about that in, in Jeremiah 40, 7 to 16. Let's just took a look, look at those words for a moment. Some of the Judean officers and soldiers had not surrendered. They heard that the king of Babylonia had made Gedaliah governor of the land and had placed him in charge of all those who had been taken away to Babylon, the poorest people in the land. So Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, and Dada, and it names a bunch of them, went with these men to Gedaliah at Mizpah. Gedaliah said to them, I give you my word that there is no need for you to be afraid to surrender to the Babylonians. Settle down in this land, serve the king of Babylonia, all will go well with you. I myself will stay in Mizpah and be your representative when the Babylonians come here. But you can gather and store up wine, fruit, olive oil, and live in the villages you occupy. Meanwhile, all the Israelites who were in Moab, Ammon, Edom, and other countries heard that the king of Babylonia had allowed some Israelites to stay on in Judah and that he made Gedaliah their governor. So they left the places where they had been scattered and returned to Judah. They came to Gedaliah at Mizpah and there they gathered in large amounts of wine and fruit. So it sounds like things are coming along pretty well, right? Doesn't that sound pretty good? And what happened? Remember? Jeremiah 41 is a very sad story. Um, in the seventh month of that year, Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, and Gansan and Elisham, a member of the royal family, and one of the king's chief officers, went to Mizpah with ten men to see Gedaliah. While they were all eating a meal together, Ishmael and the ten men with him pulled out their swords and killed Gedaliah. Ishmael also killed all the Israelites who were with Gedaliah at Mizpah and the Babylonian soldiers who happened to be there. So now, what do you see happening? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's not going to be happy. 
Nebuchadnezzar is not going to be happy about that at all. He's just placed Gedali on the throne. He's left some Babylonian soldiers there to sort of support him and make sure that everything goes all right with him. And what happens? Well, a few people who were left took off after Ishmael to try to capture him. Uh, they managed to free the people at Gedali, uh, that Ishmael was trying to, to take with him. Uh, but Ishmael himself and his buddies escaped back to Ammon. So, what do we got going on now? So why hadn't Babylon captured Ammon? Well, they did later. But apparently that wasn't their first priority. I don't know. Good question. And if Jerusalem's been devastated so much, why is there so much fruit and wine in the countryside? That would be in the countryside. Yeah, but the countryside wasn't protected by the walls, so well, why, why the, wasn't it devastated? The people, the people who lived in the countryside, countryside, most of them had already been taken prisoner to Babylon. So it was, the country was just left, and I'm, I'm sure that the Babylonians, the military people, are probably out there picking what they wanted, but they have a whole country. So, you know, remember God, what did God tell them about what they were supposed to do every seventh year? Let, it let, let it rest. Yeah. Let the land rest, and it will produce plenty. And that's what, obviously what happened. Well, so now Gadaliah is dead, and so what do they conclude? What, what do we have to do next? Figured they needed to run to Egypt. Well, unfortunately, some of the people said, maybe the only safety now for us, because we, they were quite sure that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar was coming back, and in fact he did but there was nobody to oppose him in, in Judah anymore, so he just sort of walked on through. But they thought, Egypt is still... Now, what do we know about the history of Egypt versus Babylon? Do you remember? Well, it was kind of twisted thinking that they were going to get any benefit. They, they, one of the Israeli, um, Judah kings made an alliance with one of the pharaohs, and that fell through. They had so how do they time. think they're going to get help by going back to Egypt? Yeah. And just about that same time, well, not just exactly, it was about 15 years before that, 20 years before that, the Egyptians had gone up to the battle. They thought that things were getting weak over there in the east and they would be able to reassert their power. They were just completely devastated by the Babylonians. So why would you go back to Egypt thinking that they could protect you? Uh, yeah, good question. Well... So what happens? Well, let me ask this question. How often do righteous people suffer because of the sins of others? Can you think well, of any examples? Jesus was the ultimate example. Yeah, Jesus is the ultimate example, exactly. Can you think of any others? What about Daniel? Yeah. No. Joseph. Ezekiel. Job. <laughs> Job, yeah, exactly. John the Baptist. Yeah. And what about the seven last plagues coming up? Might that involve some of us? But who's doing it? Yeah. It's, yeah, you know, it's the, those that are arrayed against God's people. But you know, you just still have a kind of dualism between the, the people that got captured early and the ones that, that are at the last moment getting wiped out. So you've got well, two people there that are different. Mm -hmm. So you can carry on that concept of the last days too, probably. I don't know how, but <laughs> well, let's, let's just review real quickly. The first time Nebuchadnezzar came, he didn't conquer Jerusalem. He just surrounded it, and they sort of collapsed. You know, and, and he said, "Well, I'm going to take a few of the best of the young men, um, the very best from people from the king's family and somebody like this, and I'm going to take them back to Babylon and make them ambassadors. And you people just behave yourself here, and I'll leave you alone. Pay your taxes. Everything will be fine." Well, of course, they rebelled against him, so he came back, and next time he said, okay, I'm going to take everybody from the whole country here, not just Jerusalem, the whole country, everybody I can find that has any skills that might be useful in Babylon, I'm going to take them over there, and I'm going to put them to work for me. So they had a grand march, so the people of Judah basically going to Babylon. Then, and so that was, a, so there weren't many people who had many skills left. In, in Judah. Then finally, the third time he comes back, and this time he says, I'm fed up with these people. He just destroyed everything. He just 
wiped out everything, destroyed after sieging the city for two and a half years. Then he took anybody else he thought was worth, even worth taking at all. He took them. He left basically the people who were so poor they didn't own anything, probably had no skills, and that's, that's who was left in, in, in Judah. And Gedaliah is in charge of them. Okay? And then they come along and they kill Gedaliah. So Johanan, son of Korea and Azariah, son of Heshiah, verse chapter 42, came with people of every class and said to me, now look at this. I, I, this is one of the most incredible passages in Scripture, I think. They came to Jeremiah and said to him, please do what we ask you. Pray to the Lord our God for us. Notice the Lord whose God? Our God. Pray for us. Pray for all of us who have survived. Once there were many of us, but now only a few of us are left, as you can see. Pray that the Lord, our God, will show us the way we should go and what we should do. Now, how does that sound? Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, that sounds great. Here's some people who seem to be humbly approaching the Lord and saying, please, please help us. Please help us. And I answered, Jeremiah speaking, very well then, I will pray to the Lord our God, just as you've asked, and whatever he says, I will tell you. I will not keep back anything from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not obey all the commands that the Lord our God gives you for us. Does that remind you of anything that you we might have studied before? Exodus 20. Exodus 20. Actually, Exodus 20, 19 and 24 are the, the, the precise places. But three times back at Mount Sinai, the children of Israel said what? All that the Lord has said we will do, right? All that the Lord has said we will do. Right? You don't think they were being honest or what? Well, let me read the next couple of paragraphs and see what you think. Okay? Whether it pleases us or not, we will obey the Lord our God, to whom we are asking you to pray. All will go well with us if we obey him. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how you could pray more honestly or more, you know. It maybe sounds they, sincere. Yeah, maybe they just thought this is what they had to do to try to <coughs> get the Lord's intention or something. I don't know. Well, ten days later, the Lord spoke to me. So I called together Johanna and all the army leaders who were with him and all the other people. I said to them, The Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me with your request has said, If you are willing to go on living in this land, what's he, where is he talking about? Judah. Judah. Then I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not pull you up. The destruction I brought on you has caused me great sorrow. How does God feel about all this? Sorrow. Great sorrow. Stop being afraid of the king of Babylonia. These are whose words? God's, God's word. Yeah. He's been there and wiped them out three times or conquered the, the nation three times. God says, don't worry about them anymore. I am with you and I will rescue you from his power. Because I am merciful, I will make him have mercy on you and let you go back home. I, the Lord, have spoken. But, that's always a bad sign, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But, you people who are left in Judah must not disobey the Lord your God and refuse to live in this land. You must not say, no, we will go and live in Egypt, where we won't face war anymore or hear the call to battle or go hungry, right? Everything's going to be safe in Egypt, right? If you say this, then the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, if you are determined to go and live in Egypt, then the war that you fear, fear will overtake you, and the hunger you dread will follow you, and you will die there in Egypt. All the people who are determined to go and live in Egypt will die either in war or of starvation or disease. Not one of them will survive, not one will escape the disaster that I'm going to bring on them. So was this, was God going to punish them? Or was Nebuchadnezzar going to overtake Egypt and they would get in the way? Okay. Or something else? What do you think? Anybody have a guess? 
Well, I think the whole thing is, is pointing to the history, starting when Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon started. You know, they, uh, the prophets said, surrender to them. And if they would have surrendered, nothing would have happened. Exactly. And so you've got, even now, even now, he's saying, just live there, surrender to him, and nothing will happen to you. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're thinking their own ways, going to go to Egypt, that that's going to be better and safer. And uh, so they're kind of, kind of doing things on their own work, their own ways of doing things. Why do you suppose they felt like, well, they, they, they did that? They didn't what trust what kind God. of thinking was going on in their mind? I don't think they trust God. They didn't trust Him. They thought that Egypt had a better military than they did. I don't what, know. What didn't if, they what, just go by and get their get their rear ends tromped on and then go, got chased home? So how in the world is that gonna? They're gonna think that they got a superior army. So. Maybe they thought that Egypt was just far enough away that Nebuchadnezzar would never bother to go there. Well, I, I, there might, they, there's always reasons why they're going to do it, but whether it's not, it's going to turn out that way. That's there's another, another possibility. They, m m probably many of them, were in that siege in Jerusalem for two and a half years. They may have developed such a hate for Nebuchadnezzar, they just could stomach the idea of, of you know, cooperating with him. I don't know. I'm just, I can't imagine what they've done here. Well, reading on, verse 18, the Lord, the God of Israel says, just as my anger and fury were poured out on the people of Jerusalem. Okay, what's the anger and fury, fury that poured out on the people of Jerusalem? God let it, things happen. It was oh. set in motion. Oh. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go, yeah. Nothing more I can do for those people, just let them go many places in the Old Testament, all the way from starting in Exodus, all the way through the Bible, many places in, in Judges, uh, and on through Deuteronomy, Numbers, God says, okay, if you're going to turn away from me, if, if I've tried and tried and tried, and there's nothing more I can do, I have to let you go. And Hosea. And Hosea, very good. Very well, good. if they decided to go to Egypt, he would let them go too. Yeah. Well, it seems oh. after all that sweet talking of God, there must have been one or two apples, bad apples in the barrel there somewhere. Yeah. You will be a horrifying sight. People will treat you with scorn and use your name as a curse. You will never see this place again. Should, do you think that would be a warning? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to comprehend this kind of thinking. Then I continued, the Lord has told you people who are left in Judah not to go to Egypt. This is a preemptive strike. And so I warn you now that you are making a fatal mistake. You asked me to pray to the Lord our God for you and you promised that you would do everything that he commands. And now I have told you, but you are disobeying everything that the Lord our God sent me to tell you. So then remember this, you will die in war or of starvation or disease in the land where you want to go and live. So it looks like they wanted to go to Egypt regardless. Even when they asked Jeremiah to pray for them, they probably all thought, well, bless us on our trip to Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Well, it kind of sounds like it's the only thing that makes sense. Well, have many of us had an experience of receiving advice from God and directly defying it? We don't need some personal testimonies here, but has the church ever done that? Our, our church ever done anything like that? What specifically? Receiving direct advice from God and going directly against it. Yeah. And then well, you can argue the Ten Commandments are advice from God. Yeah, in the late 19th century. Almost everyone disobeys those. Yeah, but maybe that's the point. Isn't that the point? Can we keep the Ten Commandments? Maybe this whole thing is pointing to that. Yeah. But you, do you think the people realize that Jeremiah was a true prophet of Yahweh? I mean, what did they think? What did they think of, of God, of the, the true God of Yahweh? What was their opinion of Yahweh at that point in time? 
you must be been. pretty weak because we're, yeah. Yeah. you know, we've been run over by all the kings, all the, enemies. all the Babylonians, all our enemies. Did they have any reason to actually doubt the words from Jeremiah or from Yahweh? Well, they didn't want to do what he wanted to do. And that's a serious problem. What happens when we don't want to do what God tells us to do? You won't do it. <laughs> of course, that couldn't apply to any of us, right? There's a lot of people that want the truth a certain way, and that's the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So until something makes them find out it isn't that way. Yeah. Well, as we know, the people of Judah and even their kings almost universally decided against following the advice given them by Jeremiah. We've been studying that all quarter long. Why do you think they chose at different times to rely on foreign powers instead of... I mean, isn't that what they're suggesting? We'll go down to Egypt and maybe hide somewhere in Egypt, and then if Babylon comes, you know, the Egyptians will fight him off and we'll, we'll be free. I mean, what do they think? I think it's just an issue of trust. It's just, it's just easier and safer to go get out of there because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, just live in the shadow of Babylon? Come on. That, that's not safe. Did they, I mean, obviously they knew about what, about their ancestors' experience down in Egypt. But there were still amongst them people that didn't like Jeremiah. And it says in this verse here, as part of verse 2, all the insolent men, I love that word, insolent men, said yeah. to Jeremiah, you're telling a lie. They didn't want yeah. to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Did the kings of Judah believe Jeremiah was an actual prophet, or were they skeptical? Well, the last king, who was a king for what, about 11 years, and the one who finally was captured and eyes put out and had to watch all his children being killed and all that kind of stuff, that king, Zedekiah, remember just before Jerusalem collapsed, he called Jeremiah and he says, for a secret meeting. And he says, tell me what God says. And Jeremiah said to him, look, if you will just march out of this city and to surrender the to the Babylonians, the city will be preserved, Solomon's temple will be preserved. And what was his response? What would my friends who escaped to the Babylonians before say about me then? Mm -hmm. I mean, his opinion, his worries about what someone was going to think about him was so serious, and Jeremiah told him it would, have, it would have saved Solomon's temple, it would have saved the city of Jerusalem, and he couldn't do it. He kind of had a shallow outlook on the situation. Very. I mean, the only thing that counted to him, mattered to him was what people thought of him. No, the rest of the city is destroyed, Solomon's temple is destroyed. No. What do they think of me? Right? It's kind of interesting, the, um, the, the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. Mm -hmm. There's no way they could have went out and surrendered because they would have gotten killed. Yeah. So they were, they were stuck there, but on this one, they could actually do what the Lord tells them, and they can go out and surrender, and they wouldn't get killed, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting to think about. Well, what did they think they were going to do down in Egypt? Probably take up where they left off. <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably thought they would live, but you know what it looks well, like? Yeah. It looks like the whole thing, the leading the, the Israelite out of Egypt didn't go anywhere. Everybody all came back again. Yeah. And that's what, that's what it would have really looked bad. Did they really think, I'm just asking you your opinion to think about this again, did they really think that God couldn't protect them? They did. They thought that he wouldn't. You mean going to Egypt? Yeah. yeah. Why, why, why else would they disobey what Jeremiah said that God had said? Yeah. Well, how good do you think, I mean, think about their relationship to God. How many prayers do you think they sent up during the siege? Have you thought about that? God save us from these captures. 
Well, that's if they even thought of that, probably to their idols. Well, remember, they were fleeing to the temple, Solomon's temple, saying, we're going to be safe here because God would never allow this temple to be destroyed. So I have to, I have to believe they, they at least thought God had some kind of power. Well, they didn't have any options either. <laughs> <laughs> so that might be still the last resort. Okay. Now, think about even what the Israelis pray about, the Jews pray about in our day, and think about what you know from the Bible, what they prayed about. Didn't they pray about the wonderful God who had led them out of Egypt? Yeah. There's lots of prayers like that. Mm -hmm. Psalms, whole bunch of Psalms about how God delivered them from slavery in Egypt, da 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 da. And so now they're saying, let's go back to Egypt. Does that sound like a good idea? Well, have we received any commands from God's modern prophet which might qualify to be like that one from Jeremiah? Do we make any life or death choices on a regular basis? How could we know if a particular choice is a life or death choice? Does Satan want us to recognize that some of our choices are life or death choices? You got three questions. Pick any one you want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm trying to visualize a sample, a, an example okay. of a choice that we're not taking that would, so I could answer that question. Okay, I will give you one. Okay. We're told very clearly, not only from Ellen White, our modern prophet, but from the Bible, God asks us to do basically three things. Study our Bibles, pray, and witness. Okay? How many of us are actually doing all three of those things? That would be a question. Well, are you going to go around and point out the people that aren't and are? No, I'm, I'm not pointing out anything. I'm looking at myself, okay? And okay, so if, you're, if not, you're, block, you're, not, you're not fulfilling that either? Is that what you're saying? I, I, I say it's probably better for me, not for me to give my own personal testimony. <laughs> okay. I would answer that by saying probably the Probably not with the intensity we should be. Yeah, probably. I'm sure all of us here and there in our daily lives come across situations where we might give a word of admonition or sympathy or something, but are we racing around knocking on doors with a, uh, a bag full of books and stuff? But the, the problem many. with that is that you never, never, never think that you've done enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could... Yeah. You could pray 24-7 and then you might think, well, I wasn't sitting up straight enough, you know, while you were praying. So I, I don't know where to, where to say, that, okay, we've crossed the line of safety here. We're doing everything we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. So, Well, um, let's go on. Look at Jeremiah 43 now. I finished telling the people everything that the Lord, the, their God, notice the Lord, their God, had sent me to tell them. Then Azariah, son of Hoshiah, and Johanan, son of Kerea, and all the other arrogant men, said, there's your insolent man, said to me, you are lying. What happens when you turn to a prophet of God, someone who's bringing you God's message, you ask him, please, to pray God to get a message. He comes, he says, here's what God has said to me, and you say, nah, you're lying. Well, maybe he was asking Jeremiah to verify what they already knew. And he didn't do it. The Lord, did, our God, did not send you to tell us not to go and live in Egypt. Baruch, son of an Uriah has stirred you up against us so that the Babylonians will gain power over us and can either kill us or take us away to Babylonia. So neither Johanan nor any of the army officers nor any of the people would obey the Lord's command to remain in the land of Judah. You know, it's awfully, it's kind of easy to... Um, blame them and say this is the stupidest thing in the world, but if you're scared, 
and you don't know exactly what to do and you're kind of on the line, go this way or that way, and then you get somebody that says, no, go this way, you know, this guy's lying, it, it might be a little bit easier to, to follow his direction than you think it is. Well, then Johanan and all the army officers took everybody left in Judah away to Egypt, including who? Jeremiah. Jeremiah, together with all the people who returned from the nations where they had been scattered. The men, the women, the children, the king's daughters. It's amazing there's still some of the king's daughters left. They took everyone whom Nebuchadnezzar, the commanding officer, had left under the care of Gedaliah, including Baruch and me. They disobeyed the Lord's command and went into Egypt as far as the city of Topinus. It's interesting that they took Jeremiah with them. Uh, why, if they were so confident, why didn't they just say, okay, you can stay here, and just leave him there? But it was almost like they took him as if, they took him as a hostage from God, yeah. you know, to go with them. So. Well, maybe they wanted to ask him to pray for them. <laughs> yeah, maybe, or change his mind. Maybe they'll work on him changing his mind. Yeah. Well, to Christians living in our day, it seems almost unbelievable, at least it does to me, that they could so brazenly be brazenly opposed to God's directions, which had been given them through to them through Jeremiah. They even accused Baruch, Jeremiah's associate and secretary, of influencing Jeremiah to lie to them. I don't can't imagine what factors influenced them to go back to Egypt. I mean... Well, you know, the more complex the plot, yeah. the work against you, the more they'll believe it. So if you start saying that the, this person influenced Jeremiah and have all these, all these intricate webs, well, then people start thinking, you know, yeah, maybe that's true, you know. Well, remember, <laughs> there's another factor. Maybe this is a factor, I don't know. Jeremiah had been telling them for years now go out and surrender to the Babylonians. So now he's saying, if you stay in Judah, the Babylonians will leave you alone. And they say, yeah, there you go. Babylonia again. You're just lying. You know? Might that have been their attitude? We got any idea how old Jeremiah might have been then? He was probably born in the 40s, 640s B.C., uh, we think he probably was born around 645, 44, 45, somewhere there. So 586, that would be 60 years. So he's getting to be an old man, and they, they'd given him a rough time for years. Yeah. So why don't you think Jeremiah, realizing all that he knew, why didn't he just go with the Babylonians? They promised, I mean, the king, the emperor, promised to take care of him. Did he have a choice, you think? Yeah. Walked right up there, and the commanding officer, Nebuchadnezzar's commanding officer, Nebuchadnezzar, and said, you come with us, we will take good care of you. But if you want, you can stay here. So was that before he left or after? Before who left? I mean, before they decided to leave to, to Egypt. Oh, yeah. They, they, there's no way they could have decided to leave for Egypt while Nebuchadnezzar was still hanging around. But did Jeremiah know that they were going to make him go. No, he had no idea about any of that, unless God revealed it to him, until Nebuchadnezzar was far gone. Remember, Gedaliah can't, comes to power, I mean, he's appointed by Nebuchadnezzar, he rules for a period of time, we don't know for sure how long, these people plot against him and finally kill him, and then they're deciding what to do, they ask Jeremiah to pray for them, so there, there has to be at least months went by. So the, the army was pretty well, the attacking army was pretty well gone, oh. and you know, all the occupation people were probably there, but but... Um, well, they've been, they were killed. The, at least the ones around Jerusalem were killed by that crazy group that killed Gedaliah. Yeah. Which could have been all of them. Or it eight. just says the Babylonian soldiers, so we don't know. I mm. think there's a chance Jeremiah was just plain worn out. Do you think God told him to stay in, Jer in, in Judah? I don't know. I would have thought he would have known that. If we go back to the beginning when Jeremiah was called to do this, did he feel like this is what his life work was and he was to stay with this group, even though they had done well, everything backwards? 
Remember that most of the Jews that he was called to minister to at that point, back in the beginning, are now in Babylon. Yeah. yeah. Often human beings faced with such a dilemma have expressed doubts about the divine origins of the messages. See? These people, if, if, if God tells you something you don't want to hear, what's the sort of natural human response? You must be wrong. Yeah. You must be wrong. God hasn't told you that, right? Another thing is they, they could get very angry. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's very likely. So in other words, it seems like the only thing they're hoping for is that Jeremiah would somehow approve of what they were doing. And then they would have God's blessing and away they could go. But he wouldn't do it again. Again, he wouldn't cooperate. Well, they were stuck in their rut and they couldn't get out of it. Maybe they thought the food down in Egypt was better. How often do we make decisions based on emotional or passionate factors? Do we allow a thus saith the Lord to guide us in everything we do? Paul said we should bring all our thoughts into captivity in obedience to Jesus Christ. What would that mean? Well, look at Jeremiah. Let's go on with our story. Look at Jeremiah 43, starting with verse 8. Then the Lord said to me, Get some large stones, now they're down in Egypt, and bury them in the mortar of the pavement in front of the entrance to the government building here in the city and let some of the Israelites see you do it. Then tell them that I, the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, am going to bring my servant, King Nebuchadnezzar, who's God's servant? King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia, to this place, and he will put his throne over these stones that you buried and will spread the royal tent over them. Nebuchadnezzar will come and defeat Egypt. Those people who are doomed to die of disease will die of disease. Those doomed to be taken away as prisoners will be taken away as prisoners. And um, those who are doomed to be killed in war will be killed in war. I will set fire to the temples of Egypt's gods, and the king of Babylonia will either burn their gods or carry them off. As shepherds pick their clothes clean of lice, so the king of Babylonia will pick the land of Egypt clean and then leave victorious. He will destroy the sacred stone monuments at Heliopolis in Egypt. By the way, I, we stayed in Heliopolis some years ago. We were passing through Egypt. And will burn down the temples of the Egyptian gods. So now how are they going to respond? I mean, what would you say? You get a message like that. Well, it's got to be from God if it comes to pass. And... You would think so. It's not... And it is God doing it, too, because how else would the throne actually be put there right where he said it was going to? Yeah. Do we have extra-biblical records of such a destruction yeah. by Nebuchadnezzar? You mean down in Egypt? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, they had they'd been through two and a half years of siege by, Kenez, by Nebuchadnezzar back in Judah. Would they find it galling to hear that Nebuchadnezzar would do the same thing to Egypt? You would think they would say, let us out of here. Somehow those people thought that by going to Egypt, they would be protected. But they had several examples of how their thinking about, about such things have been wrong in the past. Remember what they said about the temple? We mentioned that a little, bit, a little while ago. Jeremiah 7, 4. Remember that verse? Stop believing those deceitful... This is Jeremiah saying, Stop believing those deceitful words. We are safe. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. We're safe. Nobody would... God would never allow these enemies to destroy the temple of Solomon, would he? And look at, look at chapter 37, verses 7 and 8. 
Then the Lord, well, verse 6, Then the Lord, the God of Israel told me to say to Zedekiah, now he's the last king, the Egyptian army is on its way to help you, but it will return home. Then the Babylonians will come back, attack the city, capture it, and burn it down. I don't know. It is, it's beyond my comprehension. Well, did they really think God maybe didn't understand their situation and know what was going on? And, and, and one, one possible explanation for that is, remember, in ancient times, they believed that gods were assigned to certain territories. So maybe the god over here, well, the Yahweh, their god, they, maybe they thought he was only in Palestine. And he couldn't do anything for them down in Egypt. Or anything against them, for that well, matter. That's the other, other Elohim. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah, excuse me, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. But Judah, or excuse me, Jacob was his special portion. Yeah. Of course, Yahweh had demonstrated his power over Egypt 800 years earlier, and mm -hmm. they knew about that. Yeah. Ellen White made these comments, think about it. When self-denial becomes a part of our religion, we shall understand and do the will of God. What is she implying? Most of the time when we don't do God's will, what, we, what are we doing? Being selfish. We think, we, I mean, it's hard for us to even say these words, but what we're really saying right now, God, I want to do it my way. I think, what's, I think what I want to do is better for me than what you want me to do. Or I can understand my way better than your way. Yeah. For our eyes will be anointed with eye salve so that we shall behold wonderful things out of his law. We shall see the path of obedience as the only path of safety. God holds his people responsible in proportion as the light of truth is brought to their understanding. The claims of his law are just and reasonable, and through the grace of Christ he expects us to fulfill his requirements. Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, February 25, 1890. Paragraph 5. I just notice here, Jeremiah 44, 7. Mm -hmm. Now it says, The Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel. Why do you commit this great evil against yourself? Mm -hmm. huh? it, your, your sin is self-destructive. Mm -hmm. Well, the Lord spoke to me in, concerning all the Israelites living in Egypt, in the city of Migdal, Toppenes, and Memphis, and in the southern part of the country. Chapter 44, where you were just leading, reading. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, said, You yourselves have seen the destruction I brought on Jerusalem and all the other cities of Judah. Even now they're still in ruins, and no one lives in them, because their people have done evil and have made me angry. They offered sacrifices to other gods and served gods that neither they nor, uh, nor you nor your ancestors ever worshipped. I kept sending you my servants of prophets who told you not to do this terrible thing that I hate, but you would not listen or pay attention. You would not give up your evil practice or, sacrifice to, or sacrificing to other gods. So I poured out my anger and fury on the towns of Judah and on the streets of Jerusalem, and I set them on fire. They were left in ruins and became a horrifying sight as they are today. Yeah. And did God set them on fire, or did God no. let Babylon do the thing? See, that's one of our problems with Bible translating. Mm -hmm. Well, does it originally say that? Well, I don't, I don't have the Hebrew here to go by. And even if the Hebrew did say what I just said, it's the perspective of the uh, editors. Yeah, but does, if it does, says does, that God did it, God I, did it. I understand that. <laughs> well, I, I know you understand but I, that, but you're not listening to it saying that God did it. <laughs> well, 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 no. it. The question isn't whether God did it. What Jim is trying to say is, how did he do it? That's the point. Well, he still did it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. No, it, does, it does matter. Because, Why does it matter? Because later we're going to, if, if we had time to go through the rest of the Old Testament, we will say, God will say, I chose Babylon to do these things, but Babylon went beyond what I wanted them to do. Well, that's something different there. Well, that's he, exactly what we're talking yeah, but, about. Yeah, but what you just read there, it, it didn't say anything about going over the line. I well, mean, God... God had him do it. 
So yeah. we're not talking about going over the line here. So you're saying you're saying that you think that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was just as much a prophet of God, a servant of God as Jeremiah was? Well, he had a dream, didn't he? Doesn't that make him a prophet? Well, the dream was later. <laughs> well, he still yeah. had a dream, and so if somebody has a dream, they're a prophet, yeah, whether before or after. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's dream was actually a long time before this, to be honest, because it was Jer oh, Daniel. Wait, when was Daniel taken? Daniel was Daniel was taken with the first group, yes. and, okay. and okay. Nebuchadnezzar's okay. dream was when he was still a student. He wasn't even working for the Babylonian government yet. He was still a student. So God gave him a dream. Nebuchadnezzar is a prophet. Okay. If you, <laughs> you want to define it that way. Dream. Was Pharaoh a prophet? A bit more well, if Nebuchadnezzar you know, was. No so way over the line here. <laughs> well, I don't know about this prophet stuff. If, yeah, I think your expectations of a prophet might be a little bit over. Mm. <laughs> well, anyway, we need to sort of wi wind things down here with a terrible story. What was their attitude? What incredible answers did they give to Jeremiah who confronted them with their sins? Look at chapter 44, 15 to 19. We're coming to the end of this. Then all the men who knew that their wives offered sacrifices to other gods. Okay? So this is no, this is no secret, right? Certainly not. No secret. And all the women who were standing there, including the Israelites who lived in southern Egypt, a large crowd and all, said to me, We refuse to listen to what you have told us in the name of the Lord. We will do everything that we said we would. We will offer sacrifices to our goddess, the Queen of Heaven, and we will pour our wine offerings to her, just as we and our ancestors, our kings and our leaders used to do in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. Then we had plenty of food. We were prosperous and had no troubles. But ever since we stopped sacrificing to the Queen of Heaven, stopped pouring out wine offerings to her, we have had nothing and our people have died in war and of starvation. And the woman, women added, when we baked cakes shaped like the Queen of Heaven, offered sacrifices to her and poured out wine offerings to her, our husbands approved of what we were doing. You go wow. back to, uh, four times that the Queen of Heaven is mentioned in, in yeah. chapter 44. Yeah. You go back to Jeremiah 7. Look what they're doing. They're doing this to provoke me to anger, but it's themselves that are... And, and when was it that, that they were doing all this stuff? This is now, we're going all the way back before the time of Josiah's reforms. So they're saying back in the days of Manasseh and Ammon and the early days of Josiah before he did his reforms, when they were just completely even starting running amok. Well, they were doing so, something some of them, similar anyway. Some of them were back in those days, yeah. Well, God had one more thing to say. Look at, look at uh, Jeremiah 44, starting with verse 20. Then I said to all the men and the women who had answered me in this way, As for the sacrifices which you and your ancestors, your kings and your leaders, and the people of the land offered in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, do you think that the Lord did not know about them or that he forgot them? This very day your land lies in ruins and no one lives in it. I mean, how much evidence did they need? It has become a horrifying sight and people use its name as a curse because the Lord could no longer endure your wicked and evil practices. This present disaster has come on you because you offered sacrifices to other gods and sinned against the Lord by not obeying all his commands. I told all the people, especially the women, ladies, sorry, what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, was saying to the people of Judah living in Egypt. Both you and your wives have made solemn promises to the Queen of Heaven. You promised that you would offer sacrifices to her and pour out wine offerings to her, and you have kept your promises. Very well then, keep your promises. Carry out your vows. But now listen to the vow that I, the Lord, have made in my mighty name to all the Israelites in Egypt. Never again will I let any of you use my name to make a vow by saying, I swear by the living, sovereign Lord. I will see to it that you will not prosper, but will be destroyed. All of you will die, either in war or of disease, until not one of you is left, but a few of you will escape and return from Egypt to Judah. A few. Maybe Jeremiah was lucky enough to be one of those. 
Then the survivors will know whose words have come true, mine or theirs. I, the Lord, will give you proof that I will punish you in this place and that my promise to bring disaster on you will come true. I will hand over King Ophrah of Egypt to his enemies who want to kill him, just as I handed over King Zedekiah of Judah to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia, who was his enemy and wanted to kill him. Well, what do we say after mess? I mean, I'm sorry, folks out there. You, I've done a lot of reading. I hope you'll forgive me. I like my Good News translation, but the words are so startling and so stark, it's, it's hard to, to say them any better than they are right there in Scripture. How should we respond to people who are so deep in their sins they still seem to be doing very well? Think about the modern entertainers who are doing very well, at least financially, and doing everything against God you can possibly imagine. And the world thinks they're wildly successful. So why does God allow that to happen? Well, the Bible says that God gives rain to the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. but there is an end to it somewhere. Yeah. <coughs> well, I would put it in another way. The devil is alive and well on planet Earth. He knows that if a group of people actually come together and really commit themselves to following the Lord, it's all over for him. So he needs to harass those potential people as much as possible. And what's he doing with all the people who are following him? Let them prosper, right? Be nice to them. They're already on my side, the devil would say. Yeah, but how do you say that they're prospering when they're going to Egypt with nothing? Yeah. They're losing everything. I was talking about the people today who... Today. Well, you were, you were paralleling them with that, too, so I'm trying to well, figure out... I, I agree with you completely, but look what they're saying. Yeah. We were doing fine when we worshipped the Queen of Heaven. What do you say to people like that? Let them go. How would you respond to an atheist who says he does not believe in Jesus or God or anything about religion, but he believes his life is better than yours? Well, as we have seen, the final events in Jeremiah's history and his life were full of murder, intrigue, and absolute rebellion against God. Going back to Egypt was not a new idea. Do you think God encouraged Jeremiah to opt to stay with them? Why is it so hard for human beings to learn from history? You know the famous statement, the one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. I hope you've enjoyed this life of Jeremiah. We're going to, next week, I hope you'll be here because we're going to go back and sort of review the lessons we should have learned. Kind and loving Father, we thank you for this story, incredible as it seems, of the terrible rebellion of your people, the ones you had chosen to give that land to, the ones that you wanted to be a witness to the whole world about your kindness and your love and your patience and your desire to win everybody. And now look at them. It's hard for us to imagine anything so evil. And yet there it is. It's happening before our eyes. Help us not to make the same mistake as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.